using prayer as crowd control. We're going to continue in Acts today, and we're in a, uh, what's a kind of an interesting section. Um, uh, there's very little that would inspire you uh, in this text. Uh, it's, it's one that uh, uh, I've read like four or five commentators this week that nobody has much to say about it. Uh, and I'm going to say what nobody else is saying and I, I kind of learned that you could do that a while back. I was in seminary, and I, I had a great, great professor uh, who took a great interest in, in your projects. And I'd written a paper, and, uh, and I got it back, and it, it had all these circles, you know, and then a page attached to it with 28 footnotes. And if any of you have been to classes, you know, seminary classes or even college classes, that's very, very rare for a professor to take that type of attention. So each one was footnoted, and then he wrote a note to me. And one of the notes, it was, now this is where you blew it, Carl. And he said, you have a right to your opinion just like everybody else, just like the commentators and any of these people. You've studied, you've you've looked into this, and your opinion is as valid as theirs. And you blew it. I kind of acquiesced to everybody else's opinion. I'm not doing that this morning. Uh, uh, and, and Acts is a very interesting book. You know, we have, uh, we've got uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and, um, and, the, the, and, and John, and then Acts. Well, Luke and, and Acts were written together. They were, for many years, they were circulated as one book, or one book, two volumes. And so, then later, you know, it was split off, and, and this went through a lot of changes, actually. It was first just called Acts, and then it was called the Acts of All the Apostles. And that was very misleading but it's, because it's not the Acts of All the Apostles, it's an, 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 the Acts of a handful. Yeah, and one of which became very prominent over time, uh, and the most prominent, who? Paul. And, uh, and so, you know, for him to be named among the apostles was, was interesting in itself. But it really, he really is the chief apostle that we would recognize. The historians, secular historians, looking at it objectively, would look at Paul as the architect of the church. Uh, as more, they would look at Paul as being more influential in Christianity than Christ himself. Uh, because he had more to say about the church and how we shall live and what we should do and all that stuff than anybody else in history. So um, it, when we get more into Paul, it's going to be very, very fascinating because uh, you talk about a, a, the trajectory of somebody's life changing. He's the, he's the poster boy for that. And that's what we want to see when somebody encounters Jesus. We want to see, we don't want to, we don't want to see them become churchgoers, you know, all in their places with bright, shiny faces, giving their tithes and offerings. Um, you know, we want a community of people that are living life together and experiencing God together through the living Christ. And last week we talked about this important event, uh, uh, the ascension, or the week before that, uh, the ascension. And, you know, there's not much, there's not as much said about the ascension as there is about Good Friday or about the resurrection. Uh, it's kind of, a, kind of like a silent event, but it's the, it's the critical event in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus uh, is the ascension is, is the detonator. It's the thing that pulls everything together and makes it all work. And so it's a really, really important uh, historical event, and uh, and one that led one that led to actual confusion uh, amongst the apostles. Um, you have to look at them realistically. You have to read them, read the apostles and read their stories and, and know them as people to, to realize they didn't know what was going on. They really didn't know what was going on. They, they never got it. Even when Jesus said, okay, now I'm, I'm going to leave you, they go, well, 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 wait a minute, now isn't this the time that you're going to reestablish your kingdom? Because they, they thought Jesus was, they saw Jesus through political lenses. They were under the, the uh, bondage of the Roman Empire, and they thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah, the one who, who freed them from bondage to the empire. And, well, he did, but he freed all of us for all time from any worldly government and its rule and reign. Yeah, amen. Yeah. And that's really good news these days, right? <laughs> that's really comforting 
at this point in time. I've never known, and, and I'm not going to get into some political thing, but uh, I've never known a time in my life, and I start getting interested in political things back in the Goldwater, Nixon, Kennedy days. Um, and so, but I've never known a time that is as, as scary as this. I mean, it's like, you, you know, we're not serious, are we? USA, you know, but evidently we are. And so thank God that this is not the rule and reign in which we operate under. We, we're under the rule and reign of God. So um, I want to read um, out of Luke first, Gayla. Um, I want to read out of Luke, and I did remember Ed um, now, um, because Luke is the actual introduction to this two-volume set, Okay. And in, this, in Luke, he's talking about the works of Jesus. You know, the words and the works of Jesus. Then he transitions in Acts to the works of the Holy Spirit through God's people. Yeah, a really remarkable, remarkable thing. Because you remember, if you just think about the Gospels, you remember what Jesus kept telling him. That not only would you do the things that I've done, but you'll do greater things. And even, I think, for them, the stretch, it would have been a stretch to consider that they could do what he did. But he told them that he's not leaving them alone, that I'm going to send the comfort. I'm going to enable you. I'm going to empower you. He started from yeah, the very, uh, at uh, Jesus' baptism. Uh, in John, uh, the Baptist story includes this idea that, the, that there would be one who would come that was greater than John, and he would not just baptize him in water, but he'd baptize him with fire and the Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth, nobody knew what he was talking about. Nobody got it. I'm sure everybody nodded their heads like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> what does he mean? You know, what, what could this be? And I remember a time ago, uh, a guy named Bob Fulton, who was one of my mentors, uh, years and years ago, we had a Bible class one night, and he brought all this stuff. And, and, and it was, you just didn't know what it was. And, and so he said, here, take that, here, take this, and, and all these little items. He said, now describe what it is. And so he had to kind of describe what that thing was. And he used that to parallel Revelation. And the th image that they saw was something they'd never seen before, and yet they had to describe it. And so they, they were in a constant state of confusion and, and really uh, not clear on what the heck was going on. So when Jesus said, uh, when, when uh, John said, I'm going to baptize you with water, but Jesus will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit, they, they, they weren't Pentecostals. You know, they didn't even have a Pentecostal church that they went to or a charismatic church that they went to. They, they, hadn't, they hadn't heard of or thought of the Holy Spirit in a personal sense. They, they, they thought of the Holy Spirit in the sense of these great events like, you know, the glory cloud coming down from heaven and resting upon the temple and, and experiencing the Shekinah glory of God, the Kol Yahweh, the presence of God in the midst of his people. But they didn't carry it. And that's a big transition between the Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament talks about the synagogue. And the synagogue was just a place. It could be under a tree somewhere. And it was the, it was the gathered is what it was. It was the gathered. And they would read the Torah. And, and, and the rabbi would expound upon the word of God. But they didn't, they didn't carry the presence of God. And they had no concept of what that meant. Well, that's a big difference. Now, the... The Shekinah glory, the, the, the synagogue, is no longer a place. Hello? It's a people. It's you. It's me. We say it all the time that it's not this building, but we still kind of think it is. Um, but, but it's not. It's, we carry the presence of God wherever we go. And, uh, and, and that's like the big transition that's taking place here. So, so Luke is, is telling us in, in, in the book of Luke, the gospel, about Jesus and what he did and all the words he did and all the things he said. And then in Acts, he's saying, now, now here's, what, here's what the promised one is doing in the midst of the people. Let me just read Luke real quick. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seems good to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, of the things that you have been taught. So, so Luke is like a historian. And he wasn't an eyewitness. He's telling, not, he wasn't an eyewitness to the gospel acts. He was, he was 
getting information from Peter probably, most likely, and, and transferring that information to us. In Acts, he becomes an eyewitness. He, travel, he was tra- Paul's traveling companion. But he's, he's trying to give us an orderly uh, account of what took place. And, and obviously, it's a great, great thing that he did. Um, because, I mean, even now, even now, most, most his scholars would agree that, um, that Luke was a, um, a historian of the highest level. Now, there are those who don't think he was. I mean, if you read enough, <laughs> you read enough commentaries, uh, I would, I tell you what, I would, I would never recommend that a young person go to seminary. Not, 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 not right out of school. I, they need like 10 years of, of basic, solid grounding in the Word of God and, and the experience of God. Because, you know, seminary is just about theology. And there's two things you don't want to know what goes into. One, sausage, and two, theology. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, really a, it's really a dicey thing, you know. You could lose your faith really quickly uh, with all the various forms of criticism. They, they, take the, they take the Bible, they take Jesus, they take everything, and they tear it. They deconstruct it all uh, to the point that you go, you go well, why do I believe anything, you know? And so you really have to be grounded and rooted really well. My first seminary class I took, I, I, was, I was, I don't know, 30-something at least, and um, after the end of the class, I looked at a friend of mine, honestly, with tears in my eyes. I go, I don't understand a word that he said. Uh, I don't, and he just was a good friend, so he just, kind of like Don, um, so he just laughed at me. Um, in love. In love. So anyway, uh, most, most commentators do agree that, that uh, Luke is quite reliable. Okay, Acts chapter 1, we talked about um, the, the disciples gathering and being told to wait, and then Jesus tells in verse 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. It's so easy for us to look back at that now and go, because we've seen it happen. But can you imagine being them? Again, they're like, okay. But they didn't have, they did not, they couldn't possibly have a clue as to what was going to happen next. Because what was going to happen next, very soon, was the birth of a nation. The people of God. Uh, It was about to explode upon the scene and in the next 300 years just turn the world upside down. This group of misfits, this group of guys who, who just fought amongst each other and even challenged Jesus at points and doubted him. Remember in, in Matthew where it says, you know, they met Jesus and, and Jesus appeared to them and, and, and he prayed with them. And so he's the resurrected Christ in the midst and then he goes, and, and he prayed with them and they go, and some doubted. They had the resurrected Christ in their midst and some doubted. And what I love is what follows there. He said, go therefore into all the world. He didn't disqualify anyone because of their doubt at that point. He understood it. He probably, you know, probably chuckled a little bit about it, you know, in heaven. You know, like, can you believe these guys? I mean, and, and probably just, even f- just to look at what happened to them, that group, that group became this group of guys that turned the world upside down, changed the whole face of the earth within 300 years. You know, there were, I think there were early on estimates of about 30,000 Christians in the early first century. By, um, by the time uh, of Constantine, there were 300 million. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have Facebook, you know. You know, we didn't have the, the internet. And that these guys influenced, they influenced it so much that the government officially became, it was the first group that became a Christian nation. Uh, so we ought to have learned something from that. Anyway. <laughs> So then it goes on, and we get this thing, and I'm going to say something about this that's not in any of the commentaries, but I learned a while ago in seminary that I have a right to an opinion, and uh, this one I think is worth it. We get this thing called the, the choosing of Matthias, and um, it says, then the apostles returned, verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs in a room where they were staying, 
Uh, and those present were Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James. This, this is so key. And this is where we're going to really camp. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Somewhere, somehow, the light started to, to, sh- to get brighter. I mean, they, they got it. They, Jesus said to wait. And so they, they, not only did they wait, they waited in prayer. They were in constant prayer with one another. I saw a thing from a guy, a friend of mine in uh, Duluth, Duluth, Minnesota, is that where that is? Um, and uh, it was a calendar and it was a planner. And it was, you know, all the schedule and all the various things you could do to stay organized and stay focused uh, during your week and during your month. And at every appointment, it just said prayer, prayer, prayer. Every event, every activity, everything, prayer. And that's so, so simple and yet so profound because the message of that little calendar was don't do anything without praying first. And so that's important here. And then two, I think it's actually significant in that day and that time for him to recognize that the women were there. You know, wherever Christianity has taken root throughout the world, the, the plight of women have increased. Their, their freedoms, their liberties, their, their value, uh, their contributions have all increased. It's not, Christianity is not a repressive um, uh, faith. It's a, it's a liberating faith for men and for women. Um, there's some friends of mine, uh, there's a, two theological terms in that right there that you know there's trouble ahead. Uh, there's one called egalitarian and the other's complementarian. Complimentar- Um, Egalitarians uh, believe that, you know, firmly that neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female nor, you know, any distinction exists in Christ. That women and men are are the same in Christ and through Christ and through the work of the cross. And they can make a great theological argument for that, uh, biblical argument for that. Then the other group is complementarian. And they believe that, that women can do anything but govern. And so uh, they, they don't make them elders, they don't, uh, uh, you know, they don't hold office and things of that nature. And they're, and they're theological uh, ideas that people get from the Bible. And I'm going to tell you my, give you my opinion on this right now. I was cornered and asked where I stood. But where do you stand? Complementarian or egalitarian? And I'm like, Neither because you made both those things up. You're not going to read the Bible and find egalitarian promote, uh, being promoted. You're not going to find complementarian views being promoted. Uh, there's not these divisions here and there. It's just something we made up. And there's a lot of that, folks. There's a whole lot of that, where we read and then we come up with a position and then we say, now this is what the Bible teaches. No, it's not what the Bible teaches. It's what you've extrapolated from the Bible and, and supported from your thoughts and your ideas related to the Bible. I'm fine with that existing. I'm just not going to be bound by it. Uh, if I'm, if I, I'm going to be at a thing in a couple months with Jackie Pullinger. Jackie Pullinger um, was uh, 19 years old in, uh, in England, and she felt like the Lord called her to foreign missions. Uh, but to do that, you had to go through a missionary board. And so she went to every missionary board in England and was rejected. But she felt like God had called her. So she bought a ticket to the farthest place that she could afford, and that would be Hong Kong. And so she left as a 19-year-old girl to Hong Kong and found this place called the Walled City. The Walled City was a a one-square-mile city uh, with 30,000 people inside it. Uh, It had electricity that was pulled in from the outside, um, none of their own running water. It was filled with heroin dens and, uh, and prostitution little rooms. And, and this little 19-year-old girl went in there, rented herself a room, and started giving music lessons. Um, it's 
It's a phenomenal story. You should read it. It's, uh, it's in the book called Chasing the Dragon. It's definitely worth reading. Um, so over the years, she led hundreds and thousands of young men and women to Christ, led them out of prostitution, free from drug addiction. Uh, so much so that, that when, the, when Hong Kong decided to, to raise the walled city, they gave her property and built her a camp outside of the city where she could house these young men and women. And, and it exists to this day. She's older than me now. She's probably 65. And so all these years, she's just been doing it. And um, many, many, many times without the blessing of the church, without the blessing of the leadership, because she's a woman. Well, I'm not the smartest, you know, person on earth. But I agree with the old theologian F.F. F. F. Bruce. Why would God give gifts to women if he didn't want them to use them? Okay? Uh, it makes no sense. So why would God's favor and grace before governments, before nations, be on this woman? Oh, is it, is it because, well, there wasn't a man who would do it. Really? Yeah, shut up. Exactly. So, so I, just look at, I just look at what's there. You know, so if a woman's, you know, a, a great teacher, an anointed leader, I just go, okay. It's not my call, it's God's call. And so I'm just going to, I'm a pragmatist at that point. I'm just going to go with that. And I do think it's significant in that culture that, Paul, uh, that Luke would note that Jesus' mother was there and there were women there. I don't think um, anything that represses or abuses a woman or a child in the name of God is error. And we've made a lot of errors. I mean, we've had a lot of men abuse their children in the name of they're the covering, they're the leader, you know. And, and that's just wrong. So whenever you see an interpretation that it, when it's applied in a place, it represses, uh, it abuses, it uh, misuses a, another person, you just, you might want to take a second look at it because you're not going to find support for that in the scripture. Uh, God is a liberator. God is a reconciler. Uh, and, I, and frankly, I have my, some of my best friends on this earth are, are egalitarian, and other friends are complementarian. And I just tell them I'm neither. I'm just going to recognize what God's doing with a person and say yes and amen if it's, if it's God. You know, just like with a man or a woman, if there's selfish ambition and all that, I'm not going to be real impressed with that either. So, uh, anyway, that's what I have to say about that. Boy, that was not planned. Um, okay. Um, I, I'm not going to read the text because I have something else I need to do, want to do, um, the rest of it. The rest of the text deals with this, this thing where Peter all of a sudden decides, he stands up, and he all of a sudden decides that they need to fill Judas's spot. And it doesn't say that he prayed. It doesn't say that he got a word from God that he was doing this. It just said he stood up and he gave a, a biblical basis for what they were going to do and that they're going to replace Judas. So they did that through the casting of lots. And the lot fell to, to Matthias. And from that point on, we don't hear anything about Matthias. That's curious, isn't it? From that point on, we don't hear anything. There is legend, there's tradition that he ended up being a missionary to Ethiopia, and that's probably true. Uh, I'm not saying Matthias, that, that Matthias wasn't one of the apostles. I think he, because they made him one, he was, because God honors that. God would honor that. But, but you know what came to my mind? Is Abraham. God came to Abraham and he spoke to him. He said, you're going to have a son. And, uh, and, in, a, in, in an heir. And so Abraham schemed with his wife, Sarah, and she gave him her bond slave, uh, Hagar, and Abraham had a child with Hagar named Ishmael. God didn't speak to Abraham again for 14 years. It was as if he didn't even recognize that happened. And then he came to him and said, you're going to have a son. Go lay with your wife. And so, so they had a son, Isaac. Now, here's the interesting thing, I think, if you read the whole story. God did bless, I mean, God did bless Ishmael. And, and there was a nation that came out of Ishmael. 
and it's a nation that we, that we hear about almost every single day in the news, uh, Palestine. And so, uh, but God did, did honor Abraham in that, but it wasn't what God was doing. God was doing something completely different, and, and in my opinion, and this is based on what I've read, Abraham junked the gun with Hagar. And, he, and, and Ishmael, although he was a son of Abraham, who God would bless, he was not the son of promise. I believe that Paul is the, the one of promise. I believe that Paul, that they jumped the gun. Jesus said to wait. Wait. Choosing another apostle is not waiting. Um, but that's, that's what I think. I, because we never hear about Matthias again. We never see, hear of anything significant he did. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter either way. I mean, honestly, I've read enough commentaries and really bright, smart people who would straight on disagree with me. Uh, they would, and, but they don't give a great reason for it, and they don't give any sort of rationale why he was then an apostle and what works he did as an apostle. Uh, they just say, that's wrong. And what I'm saying is wrong. So you get to decide. You can think for yourself. I'm just saying, we read all this stuff, Matthias becomes an apostle, and then he just disappears. He goes bye-bye. You never read about him in the scripture again. You never read about him doing any other thing. Uh, there, on the other hand, I, we've heard a little bit, quite a bit about Paul, you know, the one that God chose, the one that they would never have even looked at. He would have never even made the list. And isn't that what it's like a lot of the times? The one that we would pick is not the one God would pick, and the one God would pick, we're just appalled. You got, you've got to be kidding. Tuttle? You pick Tuttle? You know, what is wrong with you? And uh, it's just, you know, that's, that, and you would say that by yourself, you know. But God doesn't see things the way that we see things. God doesn't look at a man as we look at a man. He looks at the heart of a man or a woman. And that's how he chooses. Um, God looks for people that are after his heart. Um, would see, Kathy, do you have a bulletin? I didn't bring one up here. You'll notice in your bulletin, thank you, a little handout. And it says, prayer and fasting. Um, you know, the, what the apostles did get right in this first thing, and by the way, i just interject this. The apostles were not perfect. The church, early church was not perfect. It did not take long at all for them to start arguing and bickering about who gets what and whose place and whatever, all that stuff. And, and so, and then, you know, Paul and, and, and Barnabas and John Mark had a big blowout and they went their separate ways, you know. Um, so uh, we look at the early church sometimes and we think it's perfect. A couple things to think, keep in mind. It's both prescriptive and descriptive. It's, it's describing what we should do, but it's, there's, there, there's times it's just describing what's taking place. There's other times it's prescribing. We're all not meant to, I'm not going to have a call here in a moment, although lock the back doors, please. Um, and, and, and we're going to have you bring your credit cards and your ATM cards and your codes for those all up here and put them in the basket. And we're, gonna just, we're just going to share all of that in common from here on out. And Don... I, I, want, I know where yours are hidden, so. Um, no, I mean, we're, we're not doing that today, are we? They did that one moment and one time. And then people have tried to model themselves after that. It was, it was, it was it's describing what took place. It's not prescribing. So you've got to make a difference between the two. Now, one thing that's prescribed is that we gather together and we'd be devoted to prayer and the apostles' teaching. That we're called to do. And John Simons contacted uh, Don and I last week, and he said he felt led to, the, the church should enter a time of fasting. And both Don and I just said, I think you're right. And, uh, and then we had, the, what are we going to, what, what are we praying and fasting about? And I think there's several things that the Lord, I felt impressed upon us. And um, 
One of the things I wanted to read that John wrote me was that one key way to clear our minds and spirits of all the distractions and noise is to deny ourselves something in a fast and turn our attention to the Lord as we seek him and be reminded that the battle is his, not ours. I think that's really key. And then Daniel Cox has uh, asked him if he would just give us a little study on fasting. And so I want you to take this and read this. And we want to call a fast for this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And we want to be praying, number one, for unity. Because that's where the blessing resides. Right? You know, we all have, in this day and age, in this political system, we all have our opinions, and our opinions are really important, aren't they? Because we're getting big fights over our, our opinions. Well, we're not about our opinions, we're about his opinion. What is he saying? What is he speaking to us? And so... That's one aspect of it. The other is what John had said, to clear our minds of all distractions. There's this, this world, this life that we live, everything in this life conspires against our connection with God. Everything. It, it, and, and so to, to deny ourselves and step back and, and open our hearts to the Lord as a people, I think is a very valuable and worthwhile thing. Um, and so, and the other thing uh, that the Lord impressed on me is I've been, you know, kind of sewing into and praying for and encouraging in, in any way I know how us to become uh, more of a prophetic people. And why, by that, I don't mean anything fancy. I just mean the people that hear from the Lord and speak the word of the Lord. You know, you know, there's no bells and whistles and sirens to go off there. I'm talking about just hearing from God and speaking the word of God, to speak to one another psalms, hymns, and spiritual w- w- words, songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, and what that is, is it, what, what that is, is it's you just talking and God breathing life on it. You, you know, you feel like, I feel like the Lord has given me this for you. And then you say it and you, you, you think it through and you go, I'm not going to say it. That's a stupid. It doesn't sound profound. It doesn't sound earth shattering. So I'm not going to say it. Just say it and trust that he puts the weight on it. I was praying for a young man three weeks ago and he asked me to pray for him and I, and I said, well, yeah, before I do, I said, and I said just, you know what I see for you, Ted? I, I, I see that, that the leadership that's on you, um, blah, 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 I think it's going to increase tenfold. And, uh, and I'm like, I don't know if it's going to, but <laughs> I felt this. I said, and so then I said, here, and I said, let me pray for you. As soon as I laid my hand on him, he just became this wailing, sobbing mess. And I was like, <laughs> other people in the room here, you know. Uh, it was, a, and I like, I didn't say anything. I didn't do this, you know. Um, but the Lord put weight on those words. And they penetrated his heart. And would you like somebody to speak to you and have the, their words penetrate your heart? The way the Lord, and to say, I, I really pray that that, that will be birthed in us. I know it's, it's just, it's, it's marinating, it's, it's boiling, but I think it's meant to be birthed. I think it's meant to be common amongst us, where we just, where when we speak words of life, the word of God into each other's lives. And so I think that's one of the things we should be praying about too. And so, and I also, we would also encourage you to send in um, your prayer request during that time for people and healing that. And before I go any further, I'm going to show a quick video and then we're going to have the worship team come back up. And this is a testimony of healing. Okay. Amen. Yeah. We don't do a good enough job about highlighting this stuff, but this is going on all the time. And, it, you know, it's... Uh, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, there was a time where years and years ago where we, we did, some people go, well, do you see everybody healed? Not, if I'm honest, I say no, and, but, but I see more healed than when we didn't pray for the sick. You know? <laughs> so that works. So just remember that Wednesday nights we have the restoration house, we pray for the sick. Today we'll pray for the sick, pray, minister to you wherever you're at because we serve a living Christ. We're going to celebrate that s- Sunday. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And not only did he rise from the dead, but he sent his spirit to dwell among us so that we would be the people of God that carry the presence of God and impact the world that we live in. 
Our Jerusalem is the world we live in. It's your family, it's your friends, it's your neighbors, it's your coworkers. You know, that's Jerusalem for you. And God wants to minister in Jerusalem through this people. We're gonna have these guys lead us in some worship. We'll go right from that into some prophetic time and ministry to you. And so just open your heart to Jesus today. He's here and he wants to meet with you, okay?